Hi guys, my name's Adele Onyango and welcome to another episode of Legally Clueless. No, seriously, I have no clue what I'm doing, but I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one. Okay, so let me just give a disclaimer before we jump into things. My neighborhood is extremely noisy this morning. Oh no, it's afternoon already. Anyway, so first there's like tons of motorbikes or Buddha Buddhas just flying around, but I think it's because people are indoors and they're ordering stuff in, so that makes sense. It also feels like a memo went out to all the kids in the neighborhood to just start screaming from their balconies because I'm not sure what that's about. It seems so coordinated. <laughs> I'm like, this is not a coincidence. <laughs> and then, but this one is a nice sound. There are a lot more birds in the area. And I don't want to be that annoying person who's just like, the earth is breathing because all of you humans are gone. No, but legit, there were many birds in the area, but it feels like they're so many more now but i'm not complaining i'm just explaining as to why you might hear like strange sounds in the background however now that that disclaimer is done welcome to episode 61 thank you so much for being part of the legally clueless tribe i'm recording this on mother's day this is the eighth mother's day without my mom she passed away eight years ago if you're new to the podcast I don't know why that happens. Like my voice starts shaking every time I'm talking about her. But so before I even get into myself, it doesn't matter when you're listening to this. If you have a friend who lost their mom, whether it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, last year, whenever it was, just find a way to show or to communicate to them that you're there for them this week. Because it can be not just a triggering day, but like a triggering season. It's a lot to have to go on like social media and just see everybody celebrating their mom who's very alive and and you can't or you're not able to do that. Um, There are all of these stores that send, if you're subscribed to their mailing list, these Mother's Day specials. So I've spent the last two weeks actually unsubscribing from all of those I've been preparing for this day for two weeks it's so sad so they start just find a way of I mean you know them best it could be a call it could be a message it could be sending them flowers it you know your friend best find a way to make them feel less alone or remind them that they're not alone not only on the actual mother's day but as I said it it triggers a season (sighs) Yeah, it's it's just not a cool day. This Mother's Day, I'm a little more... I don't know. I don't want to say okay, because obviously I am still missing my mom. But I think I'm a bit more... What is the word? I don't know the word, but I'm a bit more of that. <laughs> Maybe because, as I said, I've been preparing for two weeks, like unsubscribing. I think the first email I got was from Sandy. Sandy's like the delivery app thing. Two weeks ago, hey, <laughs> unsubscribe. And then the next one I got was from like a gift store. And I really love this gift store, but I was like, oh man, you gotta go because I know you, Tena, you're gonna be sending me these emails over and over. Unsubscribe. Unsubscribe from like a hotel. First, that one I didn't even realize. It's a hotel I stayed, stayed in in 2017. Why am I still... <laughs> Anyway, unsubscribe because they had a Mother's Day offer of some sort. Yeah, so I did all of that. I muted a lot of online stores that I follow. I was just like preparing pole pole for two weeks for this day. But I still woke up to the strangest thing. A WhatsApp on my work number. It's from a number that I don't know, but I could tell it's a Tanzanian number because it's plus 255. That's TZ. Yeah, that's Tanzania. It was a broadcast message. This person had broadcasted a Mother's Day message. And clearly this broadcast list is made up of people who not only do we not know him or her, but it's people you don't really know. Because I mean, if you were close to me, you'd know, A, I'm not a mom. You'd know I've lost my mom. So you'd know sending me a Mother's Day message is awkward and it's triggering. So then I'm like, who else on this broadcast list shouldn't be receiving this message because maybe they're trying hard to get a child and where you're there 
broadcasting a mother's day message it's so it's so insensitive and then it's it's unnecessary honestly it, it really is unnecessary why not just send that message to the actual mothers you know <sighs> I was just like, man. But then also it's a stranger, so I can't like interact and just, I just blocked. I blocked the number because I was like, I'm not going through this next year. This is just stupid. But yeah, that's the only thing that was like strange. In terms of the week, I just want to say thank you to everybody who has listened to the podcast on Trace FM. We are now a syndicated podcast you can listen to Legally Clueless every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 9 a.m. and 8 p.m. They added a repeat at 8 p.m., which is so dope. On Trace, and if you want to figure out what the frequency is where you're at in Kenya, you can go to traceradio.co.ke, and you can also stream the station on that website as well. It's very exciting. It's very scary. <laughs> so on Monday, which was the first day the show went live on Trace, I couldn't even listen to the show. Like, I was that nervous. Wednesday, I listened to a bit. Like, I literally just, like, log on to listen to make sure, you know, that it's on. And then I just <laughs> disengage. But it does have its pressure because if you're the first to do something, you're paving the way for a lot more people. And so I have to always make sure I keep that pressure in check because it's not fair for that pressure to be on me. But it sips through every so often. But even with all of that and all the emotions on that, I'm still pretty proud of myself. And I hope many more podcasts get picked up. Anyway, so before we jump into the 100 African story, I have to tell you the song of the week, which, by the way, before I started recording this, I listened to like 10 times. I've listened to the original, the remix, and watched about three live performances of this song. So clearly, I really love this artist. I have loved him for a very, very, very long time. He took a couple of years off music, and even through those years of silence, I was still like bumping his old stuff and just still had so much love for his art, right? Even when I was listening today to his this particular song I kept I was like man I need to see this guy live on stage it will just be oh okay well post corona because <laughs> these virtual shows are not nah no 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 him I have to see him live on stage so his name is labyrinth actually if you have watched euphoria he did a lot of the music behind that show and the song that I want you to check out is called Something's Gotta Give. I, I really love this song, guys. I love it because we've all been at that place where we're just about done. We're close to giving up. And this song is basically saying, don't. <laughs> yeah, I know how I pronounce it, basically. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. But yeah, the song is basically saying, don't give up. Like, just give it an extra push. So in the description, there's a link to the song aka the music video oh my god that video i love it as well from a poetry perspective i keep asking myself oh what does this represent what does this scene mean why has this replayed why is the car now on on the beach like ah just watch it please i've also put a link to a remix done by banks and rungs i don't know i like the remix as well it's like slightly kapuka-ish it feels very kapuka-ish like kenyan music from back in the day Anyway, you listen to it. And then I've also put a link to Labyrinth performing this song live. So clearly, <laughs> this is how much I like this song. <laughs> but I think it just speaks to moments that we've all been in. In fact, like he was asked about this particular song and he said, I wanted to create a song in the journey of my album that encapsulated the feeling of betting your whole life on something and being close to giving up before the big payoff. Please listen to it. I love it. And on that note, make sure if there is a song you love almost as much as I love this one. <laughs> and you want me to share it on the podcast, you can send that through on the podcast hotline, which is plus 254-768-628-790. And speaking of the podcast hotline, so this episode features a story by Sharon. Sharon is the first Legally Clueless listener to send in her one-minute demo to the podcast hotline of a story that she wanted to share. We chatted for a bit after that. I created story prompts specific to her story just to help her 
figure out how she wanted to tell it, if there are points that she really wanted to come across while she was sharing the story. And then we recorded the story remotely. Remotely because coronavirus. <laughs> but once we are allowed to leave our houses, I really hope I can be able to come and meet each listener who wants to share a story. But for her particular one, we recorded it remotely, which is why the audio will sound a bit different. But let me tell you, this story is so necessary and important. It really shows the strength of a mother, how important it is for fathers to be present. I don't know. I've, I found the story to be really drenched in resilience. And even after we recorded it, we still stayed on the call just talking because I was just in awe of her strength. But as usual, I'm starting to give away too much of the story. So please, let's just uh, get into it. 100 African stories. There is no proper life that you live in university as a musician. If I constantly just walked around feeling sorry for myself, I'm never going to get anything done. Uh, there was a bit of frustration in between all of that. I've been breaking my back for this company. Therapy is not for the weak or for the crazy. Stories from Africa. I met Sue, the father of my child, in 2016 through friends. We weren't like friends, friends. We were friendly. Like that person you meet when you're with your friends, you get introduced. Meet like a couple of times, then you guys get friendly and yeah, you take it from there. So I met him in 2016. We weren't close, but I knew his friends. He knew my friends. We used to hang out a bit. We got to know each other. Our friendship grew. And then in 2017 is when we started dating. But the thing is, we didn't even date for long. Uh, as in the courtship didn't even last for long. Because when we hooked up, we hooked up twice. So I don't know. We, when we hooked up the first time, yeah, we were careful. We used protection. But the second time, the second time we didn't use any protection. But since we hadn't used protection, uh, I decided to use the morning after pills. So after I took the morning after pills, I just chilled because I knew there's no way they would backfire because when reading the instructions, it says that they don't, they're, they're likely to backfire if you make it a habit of using them. And I hadn't ever used them before. It was like my first time using those pills. So I was confident everything would go fine. When I took the pills, I just went on with my day-to-day -day life. Nothing there. I just continued with life like nothing happened. But three weeks later, Three weeks later is when I started feeling different. You know, when you may not know what's wrong with your body, but there's that gut feeling that tells you something is up. So three weeks later, I'm getting crazy cramps. And I know when I'm menstruating, I know how it usually feels, but those cramps were different. So I was like, okay, something is there, but I didn't want to think much about it. So I, I just ignored it. I thought, ah, maybe it's my periods. They have come early. But deep down, I knew something was up. So when they persisted for two weeks, the cramping, when it persisted for two weeks, that's when I decided, let me just go to hospital and get checked and see what's up. When I went to hospital, because the doctor asked me, they usually asked you when was the last time you had your period. When they, he asked me those questions and I replied. So he told me, we are going to do a urine test and then we'll take it from there. When they did the test, that's when he confirmed to me that I was pregnant. So I was like, okay, 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 this is, I didn't expect this, but um, I knew it deep down that I was pregnant. So he was like, okay, are you ready to start with the clinic visits? Because we have to do other tests. We have to do the blood test, test for any abnormalities, to test for STDs. So I told him, me, I just need, I need a moment. Because he just told me I'm pregnant. And now you're telling me I have to go through a bunch of tests. Test. So give me a moment. Yes, I will take the test, but I will come for the results tomorrow when I've collected myself. So I got my blood work. I went to the lab. They did the, the blood work, but I didn't check the results. I just went home. I went home and then I texted Steve and I told him, so I'm from hospital and this is what they've told me. Uh, I, he didn't reply. I didn't get a text back. So I, I assumed he's also processing it. So the following day, I went to hospital. 
I was mentally prepared to get my results. And even the reason I didn't get, I didn't check the results the first time was because I was scared. Because you know, when they do, when they do your blood work, they are just not testing for STDs and whatnot. They're also testing for HIV and AIDS. So that's a big deal. So I was kind of scared. So when I went, the doctor told me, okay, you're negative. But you have to decide when you're going to start taking, when you're going to start your clinic visit. And I told him, it's it's cool, let me just, they give you a book. They usually give you a book where they've written everything. So you go with your results and the book in case when you decide to start your clinic visit, you go with the book, they'll be writing in that book. So when I went home, I told Steve that we needed to meet. So when he agreed to meet with me, so I told him what happened. He was chilled about it. He told me, it's okay. We'll handle this together. It's fine. You don't worry. You just go home. I'll take care of this. So, like, a week later, the it's cool. We end this together. Turned to a blame, blame game. Blaming each other. So, why weren't you vigilant? Are you sure you took the pills? Are you sure you took them correctly? Then I was like, yeah, I did. Or did you want me to, did you want to supervise while I was taking the pills? I was like, no, but something doesn't feel right here. Like, there's no way you can mm. get knocked up the second time that we've had sex. So I was like, it's fine. You know, it's, I'm, I'm not worried by that time. I'm still not worried because, I mean, we are friends. Eh? Before we dated, we are friends. He's my friend. There's no way he can decide that he doesn't want to be part of my life and he knows the child is his. So I'm chilled. I'm, I'm not, I've just decided to give him time to to figure things out, then he'll come back to me. I was confident. I was sure he would look for me when he was ready. But when like two months went by, after I've already started going for my clinic visit, I wanted someone to go with me for, you know, emotional support. And also the fact that I was scared. It's new. I've never been there. And I don't know what happened. In my mind, I thought to be, I'll be going for injections. <laughs> uh, but when I went the first time, the nurse told me, no, there are no injections. As long as you're healthy, you don't have any underlying problems. We're not even supposed to give you any medication. We just come check on the progress of the baby. You're given the supplement and you go home. But the only thing they do is that you have to take that urine test every time you go. They have to check for infection. So it wasn't anything serious. And also... Clinic visits, the hospital I went to, they usually set aside. You, you're not, you don't see the doctor with the other patient. Usually have your day. Mine was Saturday. So in Saturdays, usually there's a waiting room, yeah? So it's usually full of pregnant mothers and their spouses or their, whoever is taking them for the visit. So me, I used to feel left out because I used to be in that bench all by myself. So I wanted him to go with me. So I asked him, can you go with me? He was like, no, me, I don't have time. Uh, you just figure it out. So I was, okay. I was like, it's fine. I have to go to hospital anyway. Every month I have to go. So I'll just, I'll just toughen it out and I'll go. I went by myself. Yeah, it felt lonely. It had to be done. So I went by myself all through. I thought at some point he'd be like, hey, let me take you. But by that time, by the time I was clocking the third trimester, we weren't even speaking terms. My phone calls weren't being picked. My texts were not being replied. So I was like, okay, fine. So it had sunk in that, yeah, for real, for real, I'm alone. And you know what you tell yourself? You tell yourself, let me just survive this. After this, after I just have this baby, I'll figure out what I'll do. I'll figure out how I'll mend this relationship or if it's worth mending. So the, your mind at that time is like, let me survive this first. When third trimester, I'm petite, yeah? So it, maybe the first two months it wasn't showing. But now in the third trimester, as in there's no hiding it, even if you wear baggy clothes, even if you do what, it will show. As in the bump is usually big. So by that time, I'm petite for once and I'm short. So I just look like I'm in high school. I just felt out of place. I was ashamed. So my my plan was I used to like uh, the clinic days. Wake up early. I have to be there by 7 before even the clinic starts. So that I can be the first person to see the doctor. So I'd be like, get up early, call a cab, 
go get checked, come back home. I never left the house. From the time I started showing, I never left the house unless to go to hospital. So even my mom was worried about me because I never left the house. I always kept to myself. I had even cut off most of most of my friends because we had friends in common. I had cut off most of my friends. I didn't want to see people. I didn't want to leave the house. I was feeling sorry for myself and I was tired most of the time. All I did the third trimester was eat, sleep and survive. So she was worried about me. But the good thing about my mom, she's very supportive. She never left my side. She always gave me everything I needed. She went above and beyond. Like if I had cravings, she would get that for me. So I, I can't say I lacked and it wasn't a struggle because I had a support system. So it was good in that in that end. But the person who I needed the most wasn't there. So fast forward to the day of the delivery. So I went I went into labor on a Friday night around seven. It lasted until the next day. I gave birth on a Saturday at around eleven. Yeah, it was the labor yes was long and stressful but after you know, after you are done, after that baby is out, everything just feels right. It feels like the hardest part is over. But the thing is my baby was born sick. Because of the long labor, he had like, I think the amniotic, amniotic fluid. He ingested it, so he had that in his lungs. He had jaundice, and then the doctor said he had like an infection. Also, when he came out, he wasn't responsive. He didn't cry. Now the baby became an issue because he was sick. And it's also something we hadn't planned for. Because when you're choosing an hospital, they usually give you like, a birth plan and when you choose your birth plan there's there's also the cost that come with that kind of birth plan so my birth plan my stay in hospital would last for like two days and then that was that when when choosing a hospital they usually give you like options or like there's a birth plan for a certain amount certain amount so you choose what is within your budget so mine uh when choosing i chose something that i could afford and it was supposed to, my stay in hospital was supposed to be for like two days and then I would, I would leave. But since the baby was born with complications, we ended up staying for eight days instead of the two days. And you know, in those extra days cost money. And also when he's admitted, he was admitted in the newborn unit and also my bed and food. You also have to pay for that. Even if I, yes, I was discharged after two days. But I ha- I can't leave the baby because the baby needs to be breastfed every three hours. So for m- my bed and my food, and then now the rest went to the the baby. They were they were quite high because he was in the newborn unit, so he had a nurse. He was using this machine, uh, the one that lowers the bilirubin, and also there were medication. He was under medications for the in- infection. So yeah, the bill was quite high. So because I had just enough. For what I had planned for, my mom and my uncle had to chip in. They are the ones who got me out of hospital. We ended up paying double what I had. Uh, but they were gracious enough. They paid. Now the thing that bothered me the most was the fact that he knew my due date. He knew when I went to went into labor. But when I tell you that I didn't get even a text message or a phone call just to ask. Not even showing up. Just to ask, did you guys, are you guys okay? Did you deliver okay? Do you need anything? That, that is the thing that kept me up at night. When, in my same hospital, it kept me up at night, right? Because I was wondering, surely, even a phone call, even if you say you don't have money, even if he was afraid of showing up and then he's been told to clear the bill, you could at least call somebody and ask, how are you doing? How is my child doing? Did you deliver okay? Were there any complications? Should they come and see you? Nothing. Yes, I was upset, but life has to go on. And then, you know, the hassle of having a sick baby and a newborn. And it's new to me, so I don't know what I was doing. It's just surviving. You just survive this and you try to get to the next phase. So, yeah, it was difficult, especially the first six months, because we had to do lots of hospital visits to go check if his bilirubin has gone down. And pediatricians are not cheap. Uh, when I was giving birth, I got an episiotomy. When I was at home, the stitches, some of them came off. As in, they were loose. 
they didn't like snap, but they were loose. So I knew that had to be fixed, but my baby was my first priority. So most of them, my money was going to get the baby treated, and then I'll figure it out later because it's not urgent. Okay, for me, it wasn't urgent because the baby was one who was, his condition was life and death. Me, the most I could get was an infection. So after the baby, we were told he's, he's cleared now. As in, there's no, there's no need to worry. Even if the, the bilirubin levels are high, he'll be fine. That's when I was like, okay, now let me focus on myself. I had to look for money to get the epithetomy redone. So who do I think of reaching out to? The father of my child. I tried calling him. I tried texting him. So when I, when, when I call and he doesn't pick, I usually just text him and get to the point. So I'm like, hey, I need money. I've, exa- I've exhausted all my money in hospital. I need more to get checked and for the baby to get checked. But I didn't get any reply. I don't know why I kept on asking him for help and he had showed me enough times that he wasn't willing to help. Luckily for me, I eventually got the money and I got it fixed. Uh, I got it redone. I got the procedure redone around 2018 while it was ending. So basically, I was in pain from around, I gave birth April. Yeah? Those first three months were okay. But no, the rest of the months, and, until I got the the stitches redone, I was in pain. When I figured it out, I just, I just know, after I just realized that I'm on my own, and it has well figured it out, I just stopped reaching out to him. I stopped asking for help because no help was forthcoming. Ah, so I decided I might as well focus on other things. The baby's growing mm-hmm. and you know when, and you know, you get those moments. My, the nini, the baby's growing. He's nini, he's reaching his milestones and I would love for his father to be around to see the small, small achievements or when you go out. Whether to the supermarket or to eat, you see kids with their father and then you're like, I'd love my baby to have something like that. So you get those moments when I text him. I'm those type of people. I send one text, you leave me on read. I send another one, you leave me on read. So I don't bother sending again. So it depends. If he replies, we'll have a conversation. If he doesn't reply, I'll go silent for like other four months. Or five months when, you know, when you just have that moment of weakness and you decide to reach out. But at this point, I'm tired because I'm mostly the one who, the, who looks for him. The baby is now two years old. And you know the thing about him, he's those quiet people. When you start ranting, he'll just keep quiet. He'll just keep quiet, let you talk, 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 and then he'll hang up. As he's not the confrontational type. So even if you go off, even if you talk for hours, it's like talking to a rock. You won't, you won't get any response. You won't get any reaction. You won't get any answers. So there's no point. I, I stopped trying. I stopped calling him. And I don't know. Until, I don't know where. I don't know. I think I'm done. I think my, I'm done trying. I've tried everything. Also, he doesn't live far. He lives like 10 minutes away from us. So, he doesn't have any excuse as to where he doesn't see the baby. He does, you can't tell me you can't get time to like walk for like 10 minutes. It's even faster when you're driving and come and see your child. So he's never seen the baby since he was born. Never talked to him. And I'm sure if we met him outside, he's only asked for photos. So I don't know if he met him outside somewhere. I doubt he'd recognize the child. So I stopped, I stopped trying. I stopped calling him. And I stopped looking for him. And that's how it's been. I don't even know during this period, this corona period, what he's up to or what's happening. Because I'm dealing with my own issues. And I'm dying trying. When if he wants, I don't know how I'll react. I don't know if I'll let him back into our lives. He said he'll come back when it's convenient for him. So I don't know when it's convenient if I'll be ready to have that conversation or if I try, because honestly, I'm tired. I'm tired, because we are not much in terms of lovers, but I know we are friends, 
and you don't do your friends like that. Catch our next African stories in the next episode. Yeah, you see what I meant when I told you this story was just drenched in resilience. Even how she kept repeating that in all the tough moments, she just kept telling herself she just had to survive this and keep moving, survive this and keep moving. Oh my word. So everything is interlinked. You know, I hadn't even planned that this would be the story that would go up on Mother's Day week. I hadn't planned that this story would go up when the song of the week was talking about, you know, keep pushing and keep going. It's funny how things just all work out. So I really shouldn't have said that because now you're probably wondering if I organized anything at all. <laughs> I swear I do. And as I said before, um, Sharon is the first Legally Clueless listener to share her story on the podcast. And you can share your story as well. What you need to do is step one, record a one minute WhatsApp audio note, explaining to me a bit about your story and send it to the podcast hotline number, which is plus two, five, four, seven six eight six two eight seven nine zero and then i will send you story prompts that i'll work on specifically for your story and we'll set up a time and a date where we can record your story remotely i'm really excited about this because I've, I've recorded a couple of others but sharon was the first one i recorded um what a month and a half ago i think Anyway, while you're trying to figure out what story you want to share, remember you can join the Legally Clueless tribe on Instagram. Just search at Legally Clueless Podcast. And that's it for this episode of Legally Clueless. You can share this podcast with your friends. You can keep it for yourself. I'm not judging. Just make sure you're here next week for the next episode.